It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope all of you are doing well and that the new year is still going well for, for you. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I would invite you to get in touch, give me a call or send an email. I'd love to hear from you. Also remember that we are continuing to meet for worship every Lord's Day at 9 a.m. at the building. And please be sure to sign up online for that through the Sign Up Genius account. Some of you know that this past Saturday night into Sunday morning, for some reason, Sign Up Genius went down for 12 plus hours. And so we looked into that. We're thankful to uh, Kenna for uh, exploring why that was. And it got back up and running. But just so you know, it's not a perfect system. But I think that may be one of the first times that it's actually gone down in that way. But I uh, hope you can sign up online so we know who's coming and to see whether we need to make different plans. And if the 9 a.m. service fills up, as our tradition has been over the last couple months now, uh, we'll also plan on replaying the 9 a.m. service uh, at 10.30 a.m. at the church building using the projector up front. So 10.30 will not be a live service, it'll be a replay. But if it does fill up at 9 a.m., that is our plan for that. If you need any help signing up, if anything goes wrong, feel free to give me a call or get in touch with Kenna as well. And we'd be glad to try to get you, uh, get you squared away there. If you're listening tonight by phone and need any help with this, if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope that you will give me a call at 608-224-0274. That is the church number. And we can accept calls and text on that number. Uh, also, if you missed it over the past couple days, some of you might have noticed that we put another video out on Monday. I guess I would call it a little bit of a bonus video. It's only about seven minutes long. Uh, just a follow-up from something I just briefly referred to on Sunday that uh, refers to the daily Bible reading. So a few more ideas for that. And feel free to share comments down below on that if you uh, have any other ideas about daily Bible reading. I know there are many uh, different ways of reading through the Bible in a year or reading through the New Testament in a year. Anything that we can do to try to keep us close to the Word of God is helpful. And hopefully some of those links that are provided there will be helpful to you. Uh, also, I don't know if you can notice tonight, but I'm making progress in the garage on our pile of wood. I don't know if the uh, depth of field is a thing here or you can tell or not, but we used to have three stacks of wood behind me. We have gone through the first full stack, and if you can tell, we are halfway through... Uh, the second row of wood and so you can see the third row back behind me that's up against the back wall of our garage and this uh, row here in the middle is almost halfway gone so I think we're gonna make it through the winter this year and uh, staying warm in that way but anyway out here in the garage thought I'd just uh, give you a little bit of a inside scoop on what's going on out here in the garage and I think I noticed the last time I was out here I could see my breath as I was teaching class last Wednesday. I haven't seen that yet today, but it is a little bit chilly, but uh, no, no problem at all. Okay, tonight we are getting back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, in case you're joining us for the first time, just want to give a little bit of a background here. We know Luke is a Gentile. He writes both the book of Luke and Acts. So volume one and two, the life of Jesus, the life of the early church, the growth of the church in the book of Acts. And he's writing these books to a man by the name of Theophilus. He is a Gentile, he is a medical doctor, he includes a lot of people who are often overlooked or neglected or oppressed in the ancient world. Uh, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, the widows, women, the sick, the poor, and that kind of thing. And uh, Luke does a, good job of does a very good job of including them in a way that the others do not. Uh, once again, the harmony of the Gospels will once again be very helpful tonight. In case you are interested, the harmony of the Gospels is available on Amazon. For around 25 bucks, it is basically just the four gospel accounts arranged in columns parallel to each other. And the harmony is especially helpful in the last week of Jesus' life. And that's where we are right now. And I've mentioned it before. I haven't shown it on the screen. But in, let's see, page 348 and 349, it's next to the last opening. So the last opening in the book would be the maps and a diagram of the temple. Then it's the end. So a couple pages in from the very end of the book, there are two charts. And the one on the left-hand side uh, refers to the ministry of Jesus all three and a half years, arranged in chronological order with the section numbers out here beside. And so uh, all the chunks back in the, the main part of the book are arranged by section number, and that allows us to plug it into the timeline here. Well, they do the same thing on this side, but it's very zoomed in just on the last week, since there is a whole lot of information there. Uh, it's kind of crammed into just a few chapters, and so those section numbers are here. 
and that may help us to follow along. So if that's helpful, that's awesome. Uh, last week, we spent most of our time together looking at what happens on the Thursday evening before the crucifixion that happens on Friday. And so we're now partway through what we would commonly refer to as being the Last Supper. Of course, a lot of artwork has featured the Last Supper with the apostles uh, gathered around the table, or I guess we might say on one side of the table, which is kind of strange the way many artists portray that. I think I've seen one a few months ago about the Last Supper on Zoom with all the apostles in little boxes. Maybe you've seen something like that, which is kind of funny to think about. But on that last week, Jesus is teaching in the temple during the, the day, and then he's heading out to the Mount of Olives to spend the night basically camping out there during the evening time. And then he would go back and forth. As far as we know, he never spent the night in the city of Jerusalem, but he would go into the temple in the day and then at the nighttime go back out to the Mount of Olives. And on Thursday of the crucifixion week, Jesus sends Peter and John into town to prepare the Passover meal, which they do. And during that same rough period of time there on that Thursday, Judas makes the final arrangements to betray the Lord. He is paid the 30 pieces of silver, and then they all get together for dinner. From John's account, we looked at Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And so that's something that's in John and nowhere else. And then we see Jesus predict that somebody would betray him. And so Jesus knows exactly what is about to happen. And then we have the apostles arguing back and forth a little bit concerning who it might be who will be betraying the Lord. And Jesus indicates to Judas privately that he knows that it's him. He also communicates this to Peter and to one other apostle. We usually assume that that is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And uh, Judas then leaves at that point. And we pick up tonight with Luke 22, verse number 24. So tonight we're in Luke chapter 22, and our first paragraph is verses 24 through 30. So Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 30 will be the text that we're uh, starting with tonight. <clears throat> and there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves." You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So by way of review, let's remember we have just had the back and forth about who it is who would be betraying Jesus in chronological order. That has just happened, so they're, they're still kind of winding that up. Uh, Judas leaves at that point in John's account, and now we have this argument among the 11 at this point. So Judas is gone. We're down to 11 apostles. And the 11 who are left are now arguing among themselves concerning which one of them is the greatest in the kingdom. And it's almost hard for us to imagine this. I mean, first of all, it's hard to imagine Peter and John or any of these men having an actual argument about which one of them is the greatest. This is something little children do, and I know they've done it before, but Jesus has corrected this behavior before, and yet they are at it again. And I'm trying to picture this in my mind, and it's really pretty difficult to try to imagine Peter and John and the others arguing about which one is the greatest. And in my mind, I'm, I, you know, a couple days ago as I was looking at this passage again, I, I was trying to Imagine this argument between the three elders of the congregation, the three of us sitting down and actually getting in an argument about which one of us is the greatest. And it's a ridiculous discussion. And, and I really cannot imagine the, the three of us even getting close to getting into it over something like that. And yet that's what's going on with the 11 apostles. From our point of view, who really cares? It, it is a ridiculous, it is a stupid discussion. But I also know that we're looking at this with perfect hindsight. I almost said 2020 hindsight. I, can't, I don't know if I'll ever be able to say that again. 
Um, but but we're looking at it because we from from this point of view we know what's about to happen later in this exact evening just a few hours after this so we're looking at it through those eyes and of course they don't really understand what's about to happen but at least from that that first of all I think I'd say it's really it's hard for us to imagine the apostles these men who've trained with Jesus having an actual argument over something like this it's almost like something we might see on an elementary school playground I don't know if, if kids argue anymore about who's the greatest. Maybe maybe kids are over that. We had stuff like that going on at, uh, at our elementary school as I was growing up. We had a series of hills on our playground and we would play king of the mountain, king of the hill or whatever, where we would actually wrestle and try to throw each other off. And in my mind, it's almost what's going on here, only it's between grown men. And it's hard for us to imagine that. So it's, it's hard from that point of view. But secondly, it's also hard to imagine this from the Lord's point of view. Can we try to put ourselves in his place? I mean, he knows what's about to happen. They don't, but he does. He knows that within a few hours, he will be betrayed. And he'll be put through a series of unjust trials, marched around from one side of town to the other, beaten several times, publicly humiliated, scourged and then executed in one of the most brutal and it literally excruciating ways ever imagined. And here, even after three and a half years of intense training, his closest friends, his most diligent students, still don't get it. They don't understand what this is all about. And so from this point of view, uh, it's also very hard to imagine how frustrating and really how infuriating this must have been for the Lord to endure this, to have all of this on his mind. And then on top of all of that, to, to have to deal with this dispute almost between children. Uh, but when he sees what's happening, ultimately he uses it as another opportunity to keep on teaching, to keep on training, to get back to what he's been saying all along. And he explains that there is a huge difference between the way people do things in the world and the way things need to happen among God's people. There's a difference between the world and the kingdom of God. Uh, in the world, among the Gentiles, as he puts it here, yes, uh, some people are more important than others. And some people will always be interested in bossing other people around and shaking fingers and, and getting their way uh, by force and by manipulation. In the world that happens, but the Lord reminds us here once again, on top of all of these other times that he's already said this, that this is not the way that it needs to be among God's people. Among God's people, leaders serve, and the greatest among us are to become like the youngest. Uh, in the church, therefore, everything gets turned completely upside down in this regard, and he illustrates this by referring them back to what he just did. Um, normally, the one who reclines at the table and gets served by others, the guy reclining at the table would normally be considered to be the most important in that situation. If we were to just walk into a room and one guy is sitting down getting served food, um, he's the guy who's probably the most important. And yet, if you had stepped into this room in first century Jerusalem on this Thursday evening 2,000 years ago, and if you had observed... Jesus is the one who would have been considered the servant. And yet here he is. He is the son of God. He is truly the most important person in that room. And yet he is the one who is washing their feet instead of the other way around. In other words, they had completely missed the point of this thing that he had just taught them a few minutes, literally a few minutes before this. And so Jesus repeats it here yet again. The most important thing that we can do in the kingdom of God is to serve. And if that was true then, which it is, which it was, it continues to be true today. The kingdom is not about ruling over other people. The kingdom is about serving, uh, putting others first, doing what needs to be done. Nothing is beneath us in terms of service. And certainly we don't need to be arguing amongst ourselves concerning which one of us is the greatest. That, that's absolute, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, then there's a bit of a shift. Notice in verse 28, Jesus seems to almost uh, thank these men or congratulate them. That's not really the perfect word there, but uh, for standing by him in his trials. And so maybe he is acknowledging them for this. 
And again, within a few hours, they will all abandon him. <laughs> It'll be the opposite of what he's congratulating them uh, for here. Uh, but for now, at least, Jesus is giving something of a compliment. Maybe we could put it that way. And in return, they will be given the honor, if we want to put it in that way, of, of eating and drinking at his table in the kingdom and sitting on thrones and judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And I wish that he had explained this a little bit more, but he doesn't. He just kind of leaves it there. We have other passages about judging others, maybe by our example, maybe in some literal way. Um, the apostles will serve as judges at the end of time. I don't know, uh, but he just doesn't nail it down here. But it's interesting to me that we have 12 thrones, don't we? And yet remember, how many people are there? Well, there are 12 in the room, but uh, there are only 11 of the apostles left. Judas has already gone at this point, if we've got the timeline right, which I think that we do. Judas has just left. Uh, in the harmony, we have a few verses from John inserted here. John 13, 31 through 36. And this comes right after Judas leaves. And Jesus talks about how he himself, the Son of Man, uh, will be glorified. And Jesus then says, where I am going, you cannot come. So we see some allusion there to him dying and going to paradise, to a place where they will not be allowed to go at this point. But, of course, they have no clue. They don't understand this at all. It's something they will figure out later. And then he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So that gets inserted right here in time sequence, uh, right, right around this passage from Luke. So let's move on then and move forward to Luke 22, 31. Luke 22, 31 through 38 is the next paragraph. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 38. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord... With you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. And he said to them, When I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, No, nothing. And he said to them, But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with transgressors. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. In the harmony, we have an extremely abbreviated version of this over in John chapter 13. But we have quite a bit more detail here in Luke that we don't have elsewhere. We studied this passage in sermon form, by the way, back on March 16th, 2014, almost seven years ago. Um, so I'm sure all of you remember that, and we really don't need to review this hardly at all. Uh, but Jesus lets Simon Peter in on some behind-the-scenes information here, doesn't he? Letting him know that Satan has demanded permission to sift him like wheat. What does that remind us of? I know if we were together, we could discuss this, obviously, a little bit more. But uh, to me personally, this reminds me quite a bit, at least, uh, about Job. Remember the whole book of Job. Remember Satan approaching God and having something of a similar discussion about Job. And ultimately, God allows the, the sifting or the testing that Satan does. And thankfully, Job passes that test. Uh, here, Jesus doesn't really seem to be in a position to grant permission or deny permission in one way or the other, but he knows about it, doesn't he? Jesus has some knowledge that Satan has demanded uh, permission to sift Simon Peter like wheat. And um, notice he, he tells Peter that he has prayed for him. And I'll admit, I personally don't remember too much from that sermon seven years ago, but uh, I do remember the wording of this being interesting, that it's a bit more comforting to hear that somebody has prayed for us than to hear them promise that they will pray for us. I don't know if you remember that. I, I remember that from that lesson. And so I've tried to make it a custom uh, when I talk to somebody about praying for them. I, I try not to say we will be praying for you, but, but I try to emphasize um, we have prayed for you. We've been praying for you. We have prayed for you in our family at dinner tonight or whatever. And personally, I appreciate that more. 
uh, because I know it's not something that they might forget, but it's something that they've already done and that they are continuing to do. And so Jesus says that he has prayed for Simon in this way. And notice what he's prayed, that Peter's faith would not fail. But then in a sense, when it does, that Peter would return and use that experience to strengthen his brethren. So Jesus obviously knows then what is about to happen. Of course, Peter pretty much promises that he's ready for anything. Uh, Lord, I won't give up on you for nothing. I, I will stick with you to prison, to death, whatever it takes. Uh, I will never fail you, no matter what. And yet we know uh, Peter, in fact, will leave the Lord, won't he? He, he will deny him. And so Peter won't just deny the Lord once, but three times, and then the rooster will crow, at, almost as a reminder, almost as a little bit of an I told you so, or as a reminder of what Jesus had said here on this evening. Okay, we got a little bit of a shift in verse 36, and Jesus now tells these men to prepare for what's about to happen, and to be prepared, they need three things, don't they? In terms of physical, in their hands, okay? They, they need money belts, they need a bag, and they need a sword. And if you don't have a sword, sell your coat and buy one. That tells us something about the importance of what he's talking about here. Sell your coat. Uh, very few of us would sell the only coat that we have, especially in January in Wisconsin. Uh, but if you remember previously, Jesus had told them not to take along a money belt and a bag and sandals and these things. But rather, what were they to do? They were to rely on the generosity of strangers, rely on other people for these things. And when you teach them the gospel, allow them to share a meal and a place to stay and so on. Uh, but now, as I understand this, they will not be able to rely uh, on others in this way. This is different than it was a couple years previously. And the reason is Jesus is about to be numbered with the transgressors. As I understand this, they will now be pretty much on their own for at least a little while now. Jesus is a criminal. He will be considered uh, on the outside of civilized society, at least for a short time. And people may not be willing to help them if they identify themselves as uh, followers of the Lord. Remember, Jesus says, uh, is about to be crucified, and people don't want to be identified with a, with a crucified man for fear of being crucified themselves. And so Jesus tells them to prepare for this. And also remember, Judas, the guy with all of the money, has now switched sides, hasn't he? And so any money that the apostles had as a group, we assume, is now gone. If Judas is the keeper of the money box, which we know that he is, um, they don't have funds at this point, even to survive another day or two. That They are on their own now. And uh, Judas has now switched sides and, and has already left the room. And so Jesus says, you need these things with you that I previously told you you didn't need to take along. Now you need to take them. Uh, at the end here, the 11 apostles look around among themselves and they realize that they already have two swords. And I find that interesting. I don't know if we always think about the apostles running around with swords, but apparently they did, right? That was a normal thing to do. And I would point out at least two of them have swords on them already. Um, or another possibility, one of them was super duper prepared uh, with both a primary and a backup sword. <laughs> and that is a possibility here as well. That might have been Peter. We know later in the night Peter is the one who's going to use a sword. Uh, but either way, they already have two swords in this group of 11 people, and that's just what they happen to have on them at the moment. And Jesus says, it is enough. That'll do it. That This is what we need, and uh, this will accomplish what we need to accomplish. Uh, just a note here, one of these swords will uh, pop up later in the night. Uh, not later in our night, tonight, in January 2021, but uh, later on Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're going to get back to that uh, not, and not too long from now. Okay, now we get back to Luke 22, 17 through 20, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Now, if you're in the harmony, this is just what comes next. We're just going through in time order. If you are in your own copy of the Bible, you'll notice that we are now going backwards. We need to back up a little bit and cover this paragraph that we skipped a week or two ago. And I know it makes the uh, print a little bit smaller on, on the screen here, but I'm including the parallel passages uh, from Matthew 26, Mark 14, and also from 1 Corinthians 11. And it might be strange to have a parallel account 
from outside the gospel accounts. Remember, the book we're studying is the harmony of the gospels, and yet we have this little piece from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And that's a little bit strange until we realize that 1 Corinthians was probably written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and definitely before John. And so in time sequence as to when pen was put to paper, it seems that Paul probably writes first, and then Matthew and Mark, and then Luke, and then ultimately John, And which John, interestingly, although he includes a lot from the last night of the Lord's life, does not include the institution of the Lord's Supper. Um, so I've done this also to show that Luke includes two cups. That's why Luke has this little tumor of a paragraph popping up above the other. So that's why it looks a little bit weird. And uh, somebody was walking by my chair in, uh, in the living room earlier today or last night. I can't remember when it was and said, hey, what's that, uh, what's that thing doing up there? Well, um, there's a reason for the, the kind of the weird formatting here. Uh, usually we think of the Lord's Supper as being the bread followed by the fruit of the vine. But in Luke, we have cup, bread, cup. And so instead of just bread and cup, we have cup, bread, cup. And so let's look at Luke and let's see if we figure out what's, what's going on here. So let's look at Luke 22, verses 17 through 20. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. So I hope we've noticed that we have cup, bread, cup here in the book of Luke. But we also need to notice that the first cup is not a part of the Lord's Supper, but it seems to be a part of the meal that they were eating at the time. And I say this because uh, Jesus never refers to the first cup as being his blood, as he does with the second cup. We, we do some reading, we do some research on this, and it seems as if the traditional Passover meal included sharing the cup uh, at several times or several intervals spread throughout the meal and so there is the first passing of the cup which represents this and there is the second passing of the cup they, they had their traditions they had the way that they did things and and different meanings assigned to each sharing of the cup and so the first cup in the book of luke seems to be tied to the meal one of those other uh, cups that was shared and then he moves into what we understand to be the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup. And so let's not get uh, too worried by that to see cup, bread, cup, and, and be concerned. Uh, but let's remember they were eating a meal before this, and it seems to be after the meal or as the meal was wrapping up that he institutes the Lord's Supper. We just in Luke happen to have one of the other cups that was shared. Uh, when we come down to the Lord's Supper, starting in verse 19, uh, Jesus starts then with the bread. And the first thing I notice reading this passage through a few times is that it is not described in these passages as being unleavened bread. Um, certainly we would assume that here it would say unleavened bread. I, I might have missed that, but I don't see that here. Um, however, it's safe to assume that it is unleavened bread due to the context. And so we need to remember the meal that they are eating here. What are they celebrating? Um, the traditional uh, Passover meal. This is taking place during the Passover, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we need to understand this is when this is happening. And so it, it seems very safe to assume that during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during the Passover meal, uh, certainly the bread that they are eating is unleavened, even though that is not specified specifically in these um, parallel accounts. All right, then we also have uh, two references to unleavened bread in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where sin is pictured as leaven. So that seems to strengthen this concept of partaking of unleavened bread together uh, with our Christian family. And then you may remember also from Exodus uh, chapter 12, I believe, that uh, the people were to prepare unleavened bread on their way out of Egypt. And um, they didn't have time to let the bread rise and all that, but they were to make their food to go. Uh, we've become very good at to-go food, haven't we? Uh, in, 
coronavirus culture, we might say. And so we know what it means to eat a meal standing up outside or on the run or in the seat of the car as we're driving or parked somewhere. And that is the original Passover meal, and they are celebrating that again here. So the Lord's Supper is instituted uh, during the annual commemoration of this great event. So we would, I think, very safely assume that they were dealing with unleavened bread, even though it doesn't specifically say it here. I would also point out that Jesus blesses the bread, and, and some have wondered what that means. But in Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 11, and in Luke's account here in Luke 22, uh, Jesus gives thanks. So a couple accounts say he blessed the bread, a couple accounts say he gave thanks, then I would therefore combine those and I would take blessing and thanking as synonyms here. To thank is to bless and to bless is to thank. And so some people have asked me serious questions. How do we bless the bread? What are we doing when we bless the bread? What is that? And I think we look at those four accounts and combine them, and to bless the bread is to give thanks for the bread. Jesus isn't turning it special in the prayer that he offers, nothing like that. He's just giving thanks for the bread that's there. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a huge deal that we know this, but some have wondered, so I would, would point that out. Uh, by the way, the word for giving thanks is the word that we might recognize today as Eucharist. Eucharist. And I know when I hear people refer to the Eucharist, um, in my mind, I think of that language as being denominational. And personally, I try to avoid it. To be honest, it, it makes me nervous. It just rubs me the wrong way to talk about the Lord's Supper as the Eucharist. And yet, we do need to realize, we do need to understand that it is really just a transliteration of the Greek word for thanksgiving. And so it's not really as concerning as some of us might initially assume. And like I've said, personally, I try not to go that direction. There are other things that we could call it. Uh, but the Eucharist is simply an anglicized version of the word, the Greek word for thanksgiving. So the Lord's Supper, in a way, is the giving of thanks. And so when we come together as a church to partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we are giving thanks for the elements themselves. Uh, but even more importantly, we're giving thanks for what the Lord has done for us. Uh, and while we're talking about what to call the supper, um, I remember somebody pulling me aside and correcting me many years ago for referring to the Lord's Supper as communion. And this man said, nowhere in the Bible is the Lord's Supper referred to as communion. And when he mentioned this, I panicked uh, for a brief moment. I, I seriously thought to myself, oh no, I... I've referred to it as communion for, for all of my life, and maybe I've been mistaken my whole life. I, I don't know. And so I started looking into that, uh, you know, referring to the Lord's Supper as communion. Can we call it communion? And so I looked it up, and in the New American Standard, in most modern translations, the Supper is, in fact, uh, never referred to as communion. However, when I dug a little bit deeper, I did find it in the King James Version and also in the American Standard Version going back to the early 1900s in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. The New American Standard uses the word sharing instead of communion. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, this is what Paul says. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we are all uh, we all partake of the one bread. And so I uh, I was a little bit relieved there. I, I pointed this out to the brother who corrected me because in the King James and again in the American Standard, um, that passage I just read where it says sharing, um, the King James and the ASV actually use the word communion. And so I was relieved personally, and so was he. And he was thankful to learn that. And that, that it was a good teachable moment. It was, uh, we both learned something that day. Um, but the language is somewhat dated. So just be aware, um, communion is a valid word used to describe what we're doing. Um, I know today we usually don't talk about communing with people, do we? It Maybe... 400 years ago, if you might have said, hey, would you like to commune with me today? Get together over the lunch break and commune. Well, um, I don't know if I've ever said that to anybody, but the idea of sharing, you want to share a meal? Um, that is a little bit more familiar to us. In fact, uh, it is the same word that we sometimes translate in some modern translations as fellowship. 
And so fellowship, sharing, or communion are all translations of that one a Greek word that we're talking about that is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, by the way, as I was preparing for tonight's class, Amazon showed up with another order of the prepackaged communion supplies. They have been in demand over the past 10 or 11 months. And so I put the, the box right there beside me at, uh, <laughs> off of my kind of green throne in the living room there. And I just took a picture real quick earlier in the day. And I, I found it interesting that the brand name for these is Fellowship Cup. And so I would just remind us there, fellowship, sharing, and communion, all three of those words go back to the same Greek word. And I, I just found that interesting, and I thought you might as well. But back to the text, back to the reference to bread. Uh, notice the bread represents the Lord's body. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so although he says, this is my body, we do need to realize that it is not literally his body, as some religious groups teach today, but instead it obviously represents his body. There is a figure of speech going on, a figure of speech that is used all throughout Scripture in a number of different ways. And so it is not literally his body. As he gives the bread to these men, uh, pieces of his own physical body are not disappearing here. I, I hope that makes sense. I think that's a ridiculous thing to even picture. And so when we partake of the bread, we remember the Lord's body. We are not eating his actual body, but we are eating this piece of bread and using that to remember the body of Christ and what he went through for us, the beatings, the scourging, and the crucifixion. So personally, when I take of the Lord's Supper, I try you know, as best I can to remember when partaking of the bread, I, I focus on the Lord's physical suffering, what his body went through. This is my body. And when we eat that bread, we're thinking about the pain that he experienced and what he went through for us. In the text, we then move from the unleavened bread to the cup. And something I find interesting here is, just as the bread is not explicitly described as being unleavened, but it takes a little bit of a logical leap to get there, although we're on safe ground to do that. I'm not I'm not cutting that. That's a valid thing to do. So also, Jesus never really describes what is in this cup as he gives it to them. They were there. They could see what was in it. They could taste it. Uh, but instead, the description comes a bit after the fact, almost in a by-the-way kind of way, afterwards in Matthew and Mark. And then beforehand in Luke, as he refers to the fruit of the vine. So that's what's actually in the cup that they're drinking out of. Uh, and this is something I never really thought about until just a couple years ago. What they are drinking here is never explicitly described as wine. And I'm not making the point here that it was or it wasn't. That's not the purpose of this study tonight. But I do find it interesting that Jesus could have described it at, as wine if he wanted to. But he uses a slightly different description. He doesn't use the word wine. But he describes it as the fruit of the vine. And this certainly allows for keeping with the unleavened nature of the Passover. And so as we describe the Lord's Supper today, I, I personally try to not describe it as wine. Because Jesus doesn't call it wine. He refers to it as the fruit of the vine. And so if he did that, then certainly we can use the same language that he used by referring to it as the fruit of the vine. And just as the bread represents the Lord's body, uh, so also the fruit of the vine represents his blood. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And again, the fruit of the vine is not literally blood, even though Jesus says that it's his blood. Uh, but it represents his blood. And this is even more clear when we find Jesus referring to the cup. If we're going to go full-blown literal here, we would have Jesus telling the apostles to drink the cup itself. Have we thought about that? Have we thought about how ridiculous that is? If you're going to go literal on this, then you need to drink an actual cup. Not drinking the contents of the cup, but drinking the actual cup. I'm kind of thinking about Moses grinding up the gold, remember? With the uh, golden calf that they made that popped out of the fire when Aaron was left in charge for a little bit. I guess in that sense, they might have actually uh, drank cups 
Um, those things that were golden were ground up and, and consumed. But if, obviously that's not what the Lord is suggesting here. And so uh, they were not to drink the cup itself, but his language that he used here is um, figurative or symbolic. And so with reference to the cup, it is a figure of speech. He is not emphasizing the cup. He's not emphasizing the Holy Grail, as we might say. But instead, Jesus is emphasizing what is in the cup and more importantly, what it represents, which is his blood. Uh, just another side note here. Think about how simple this is. Unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. We're talking flour and oil and water, and some combination to make unleavened bread, and we're talking grapes that are squeezed to make grape juice. You can't get much more simple than that. Those supplies for doing that are available almost anywhere on this planet. I mean, all cultures are familiar with flour and water and oil and grapes and grape juice. This is not complicated. This isn't climb a mountain to memorialize the Lord, something that only a few people could do. This is something that every single person on this planet has the capability of doing to remember the Lord's death. So when we drink the fruit of the vine, we think about his blood being shed. For the forgiveness of our sins. With the bread, we think about the suffering, what his body went through. With the fruit of the vine, we think about the blood being shed and poured out for us. Uh, and speaking of the forgiveness of sins, as we've pointed out a number of times, the same phrase for the forgiveness of sins is found in Acts 2.38 with reference to baptism. And so Jesus' blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Notice how those two fit together. You cannot separate those from each other. And this is important for those times when people try to say that we are baptized because our sins have already been forgiven. That's ridiculous. Uh, because then we would have to also say that Jesus shed his blood because sins had already been forgiven. And that makes no sense whatsoever. That is absolutely not the case. He shed his blood so that our sins would be forgiven, just as we are baptized so that our sins will be forgiven. The same phrase is used in both passages. Before we move on, I would also point out that Jesus' blood is poured out for us. Some of our songs might refer to his blood being spilled or spilt as some of the older um, English wordings might have it. And we understand poetic license. We understand how we may need a word to rhyme or whatever. But his blood was not spilled, was it? Oops. It wasn't accidentally spilled in the way that we think of something being spilled today. It was no accident. But his blood, more literally, more accurately, was poured out for us. It's the picture of a, of a sacrifice and a liquid being poured out on an altar for the forgiveness of sins. This was no accident. This was intentional. He went to the cross for us. This is a willing sacrifice. And here's something else to consider. This is perhaps the only memorial to be established before the fact. If we think about it in that way, when do we make memorials? We establish memorials. We build monuments today to remember something that happened in the past. We don't do it to commemorate something that is about to happen. And so think about that. That's the way it was with the Passover. They were to prepare this meal on their way out of town because they were getting ready. And then that meal looked backwards. This meal looks forward. This meal looks forward as, as well as backwards, I guess we might say. But on this night, it was definitely looking forward to what would happen later in this night. And so Jesus establishes this memorial meal before the momentous thing happens, as if it had already happened. The crucifixion is such a certainty in his mind at this point uh, that he can establish a memorial before the fact. At this point in the harmony and chronological order, we insert John chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. That's a lot of paper in the book of John. That's a lot of material. I mentioned before that John spends a lot more time in the last week of the Lord's life than any of the other gospel accounts. And and most of it comes right here, John 14 through 17. And John gives us quite a bit more information about what is said by Jesus to his apostles in the upper room following the establishment of the Lord's Supper. Uh, some highlights, if you turn over to these four chapters, you'll notice this is where Jesus explains, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Remember that from the beginning of John chapter 14. 
Uh, we have Jesus explaining numerous times in these chapters that he would send the Holy Spirit in his absence. When he's gone, the Spirit would come in after him as a comforter, as a helper, and that the Spirit would tell them what to say. And we don't have time to get very deep in that, but remember, this is said to the apostles, not to everybody. Remember, he, he's talking to the 11 apostles at this point. A lot of people look at those verses about the Spirit telling us what we're going to say next as applying to us. It, it doesn't. It applied to the apostles, the, the 11 men in that room who would go on to preach and teach publicly on God's behalf with the Spirit giving them the words that they were to teach. And some of them would go on to write this down. And they were inspired by the Spirit. So I think we need to take those four chapters with that in mind. Uh, we have Jesus explaining he is the vine and his disciples are the branches. That's uh, kind of a big section, a, kind of a highlight in this little part here. Uh, among other things, we have what we might describe as being the real Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. Uh, remember, what we sometimes refer to as the Lord's Prayer is actually the one prayer we know Jesus never prayed uh, since he asked for forgiveness. It was more of a sample prayer. Pray like this. Pray in this way. And so in John 17, we've got the real Lord's Prayer. It's, it's the words that, that Jesus actually prayed on the night before he died, an extended prayer that he prayed. He prayed for his followers. For us, he prayed for us, that we would be one, that we would be united in the truth. And then he points out there that his word is the truth. And I think that also points toward the Spirit speaking through these inspired men who would then go on to write some of these things down. He explains that in that prayer that his word is truth and this brings us to a good place to pick up next wednesday evening if the lord wills uh, next week let's pick up with luke 22 39 jesus and the remaining apostles leave the upper room next week and, and they will head out to the mount of olives one last time uh, thank you for being with us tonight either online or on the phone uh, be sure to send me any prayer concerns any updates to our bulletin so i can get those corrected and updated and please be sure to sign up online for worship this coming Lord's Day. I'm looking forward to being with you. We're going to look at the second message to uh, the church in, uh, churches in Revelation there in Revelation chapter 2. And again, we'll have the one service at 9 a.m. And then if needed, we'll replay that service on the projector at 1030. But uh, signing up with Sign Up Genius would be very helpful for us so we can kind of plan and make sure we know who's coming. And then the online and the phone options remain the same. So if you don't come in person, None of these changes affect you. Just keep on doing what you've been doing, and hopefully that continues to work for you. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for being a God who serves, a great and awesome God who leads by example and shows us what we need to be doing. Tonight, we're especially thankful for the Lord's Supper, this memorial that will continue every Lord's Day until your Son returns for us. Thank you for allowing us to study together tonight to learn more about you and to learn more about your plan for our lives. Be with us as we reach out to our friends and those we love here in the Madison area. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.